Legendary Conan Saga Explained In 1931, Robert E. Howard penned down a fantasy story called People of the Dark for the then-famous pulp magazine Weird Tales. The story was primarily about reincarnation, but he introduced a character named Conan of the Reavers, who remained a supporting character in this one, but not for long. Howard then wrote Phoenix on the Sword in 1932 and made Conan a character that is to barbarians what Superman and Iron Man are to superheroes or what Sherlock Holmes is to detectives. Such is the influence of Conan that people like J.R.R. Tolkien and Barack Obama are his fanboys and coveted actors like Jason Momoa and Arnold Schwarzenegger played him. So Howard created this character and placed him in a fictional Hyborian age, which was a period that existed before any recorded history. Howard wrote 18 Conan stories before his untimely death, but that didn't stop people like Lynn Carter and L. Sprague de Camp from writing and finishing the incomplete Conan stories. Interestingly enough, there's hardly much linearity in any of the stories that Howard wrote. The author once explained that he wrote the stories as and when they came to him, and as if a much older Conan was telling Howard about events from his adventurous life. And no warrior or king cares much about chronology. They simply narrate the events as they recollect them, and often separated by space and time. Conan was initially conceptualized as a noble savage, a man who was equal parts cunning and righteous. Although he's strong and courageous, he wouldn't shy away from taking the wrong path to reach the right end. And although he cannot be called a scholar, he does know how to read, write, and speak in several languages. One may say that his ways are entirely barbaric, but there is always a sense of duty and loyalty in whatever he does. Now such was the character that Howard created. During the 60s, Conan's popularity rose again because of the rewrites and Frank Frazetta's covers of these books. The image of Conan with ripped muscles and a chiseled body with pumped out veins came from Frazetta's imagination of Conan. And that's exactly what we picture when we hear Conan's name. Later in the 70s, Marvel started publishing Conan comics, and they were an absolute hit because Marvel didn't dilute the character's cunningness, as the two animated shows on Conan did. While the original Conan film was a masterpiece that lifted Arnold's career, whatever followed after that turned out to be a cold mess, with reports of a new Netflix TV show and Arnold expressing his interest in playing a life-weary Conan, Marvelous Videos thought it was the best time to deep dive into the entire Conan saga and explore each scenario cinematic work that is related to this legend of sword and sorcery. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. One. He conquered an empire with his sword, Conan the Barbarian, 1982. As a child, Conan witnessed his entire family and village get slaughtered by a warlord named Dulce Doom. Dulce Doom's sigil of a two-headed snake got etched into the memory of the young child, and deep down in his heart, he pledged to avenge the losses he had suffered at Dulce Doom's hands. After the plunder, Conan and other children were thrown into forced labor and slavery. He was forced to keep turning the giant wheel of pain until he became an adult, while the others perished at one point in time or another, Conan goes on to become a strong and dangerous youth. It was probably an inner fire that kept him going. After a few years, Conan was sold off and forced to fight as a gladiator. However, the life of a gladiator soon came to an end when his new owner set him free. Now, Conan was free to focus on bringing Thulsa Doom to his knees. But the path was not going to be easy because all Conan knew about the evil warlord was his sigil. So he started to travel the world at its search and chanced upon two thieves called Valeria and Subotai. The three of them discover that a doomsday cult deals greatly in snake symbolism, and the next thing we know, Conan and his accomplices raid the cult. Learning about Conan's capabilities, one King Osric offers Conan great wealth if he freed the king's daughter who had joined the snake cult. But Conan had other objectives, and he abandons his friends to pursue Thulsa Doom. Eventually, Conan discovers that the only way to his arch enemy is through the cult. So, he collaborated with a hermetic wizard to disguise himself as a priest and enter the Mountain of Power. But he soon gets captured and is taken to Thulsa Doom himself.
the evil warlord, who didn't seem to age a day, ordered that Conan should be executed by crucifixion on a tree in the middle of a desert. Conan was left there to die a slow and painful death, but Sobotai and Valyria saved him in time, while the hermetic wizard brings him to life, although Conan would later pay a terrible price for the favor. The three of them return to Tulsa Doom's mountain of power, where they rescue King Osric's daughter from Tulsa Doom's harem. But in the process, Tulsa Doom kills Valyria, who had become Conan's lover, thus fulfilling the wizard's prophecy. Furthermore, they learn that the cult members are cannibals who believe there's more power in the flesh than steel. On the other hand, Tulsa Doom is not a human, but a demigod, born from the dark powers of the evil god Set. The film ends in a tense battle sequence between Tulsa Doom's evil forces and Conan's courageous companions. Conan decapitates Thulsa Doom in front of thousands of followers of the snake cult. An epilogue, in the end, reveals that Conan went on to become king. Conan returned the wayward daughter of king. Directed by John Milius, the film remains true to the Conan that Howard must have envisioned and conceptualized. And that is the reason why many would discard Conan as an exploitation of masculinity. I mean, yes, the women in Conan's world and age are treated rather exploitatively, but they are not praying to their god, they are either topless or bound to chains, awaiting to be rescued. But we have to realize that Howard's work is not set in the modern world. It was a world that demanded the display of such dastardly atrocities. In the end, the film is a beautiful piece of work that shows the world how sword and sorcery films are to be made. And how? The making of the film was a cinematically twisted affair. Arnold's body made him the first choice to portray Conan, but that obnoxiously muscular body was also his bane. His colossal chest and arm muscles made it difficult for him to wield a sword properly, so he was asked to lose around 30 pounds. Furthermore, he was not trained in martial arts, horse riding, and even acting was something he barely knew in those days. To make things worse, Arnold's heavy Austrian accent started to pose as a hindrance. Interestingly enough, in the scene where the two dogs chase him, Milius used really fierce dogs who even attacked their trainer. So, when we see him running from the dogs, he is actually running for his life. Apart from doing most of his stunts, he had to bite off the neck of an actual dead vulture. In the end, Arnold ended up putting in a lot of effort, and his role in Conan the Barbarian helped him bag other epic roles in films such as Predator, Terminator, etc. Two, the darkest side of magic, the strongest side of man, Conan the Destroyer, 1984. The film begins with Conan getting ambushed by Queen Terramis's troops. Conan and his thieving but comical friend Malik manage to defeat every one of the guards, and upon learning about Conan's skills, Queen Terramis asks him to do certain bidding for her. B, what do you want? I need your help. No. Conan initially refuses, but when she tells him that she could revive his lost love, Valyria, Conan agrees. He is tasked with finding a lost gem called the Heart of Ottoman so that it could be used to awaken the god Dagoth. However, the gem could be touched or held only by Teramis's niece, Princess Jenna, so he must take her along. To help Conan achieve his objectives, Teramis sends her personal guard, Bambara, but he has secretly been ordered to slay Conan once the tasks are complete. Soon, the group meets a magician named Akiro, whom Conan saves from a bunch of cannibals. Then he rescues a warrior named Zula, who is being tortured by a few villagers on charges of theft. Indebted to Conan for his favor, they join him in his quest. Later that night, they reach the castle of Tathaman, which housed the gem that Conan was seeking. However, Tathaman abducts Princess Jenna by turning himself into a giant phoenix. Kiro woke up to find that Jenna was missing, and he used his magic to find her location. Upon entering the castle, Conan found himself in the Hall of Mirrors and was faced by a monster, whom Conan defeated by destroying the mirrors. On the other hand, Tathamon gets destroyed when he picks up the gem to escape with it. On their way back, Queen Tedermis's guards find and attack them, only to get defeated by Conan once again. Bambada tried to follow his queen's orders by trying to kill Conan, but failed. 
Later, Jenna manages to start the process of Daigat's awakening from his dreams, but Conan, Malik, Akiro, and Zula get trapped within the structure, while Bambada takes Jenna with himself to the queen, who is preparing to sacrifice her to Daigat. It turns out that without the sacrifice, the god would turn into a hellish monster, and exactly that happens when Zula saves Jenna from the sacrifice. Conan was getting overpowered by the giant monster, but taking Akiro's advice, he removed the horn from Dagoth's head, killing him. In the end, Jenna became the new queen and appointed Zula, Akiro, and Malik as her ministers, while Conan left the palace to find himself a kingdom of his own. Directed by Richard Fleischer, the film secured a PG rating instead of an R rating. However, Conan's toned down characterization of violence and sexual appeal led to criticism. The viewers did not quite appreciate the idea as it was far from what Conan resembled. This was largely the result of Universal's increased interference in the making of the film. After the massive success of the family-friendly E.T., they thought Conan would make more money if they toned down the film and his character. However, these were some serious mistakes. Notwithstanding, the film was appreciated and loved by the audience that it was made for, i.e. preteen children. And that was the precise reason why Conan later found himself exploring the animated world. I live, I love, I slay. I am content. Conan the Barbarian, 2011. In this 2011 reboot of Conan, he is depicted as the son of the tribe's chieftain named Corin. As a child, Conan proved to be a skilled and fearsome warrior, but his father still wasn't convinced that Conan could wield his own sword. Soon, the tribe gets attacked by Kalar Zim and his henchmen. Zim was looking for a piece of the Mask of Acheron that Corin's tribe possessed. A group of sorcerers and magicians created the mask as a weapon to subjugate the world, but when its powers went beyond control, it was broken into several pieces, each of which was distributed among various barbarian tribes. Zim found out about the piece that Corin possessed, killed him and his entire village, with Conan remaining as the only survivor of the massacre. He then pledged to avenge the deaths of his loved ones. Later in life, Conan became a pirate and chanced upon Lucius, one of Zim's soldiers, who was chasing a man named Ella Shan. Initially, Conan let himself get captured by Lucius, only to kill the guards and subdue Lucius. Lucius revealed to him that Zim was seeking a girl who was the pure blood descendant of Acheron, whose blood would help Zim exploit the powers of the Mask of Acheron. Meanwhile, Zim and his daughter Marie learned about the descendant girl's location and reached the monastery headed by an elderly monk named Fasir. After smelling something fishy, Fasir ordered his student named Tamara to flee from the monastery. However, Zim's henchmen soon catch up to her, but she gets saved by Conan. Obviously, Tamara was the girl that Zim was seeking, but Conan's victory was short-lived because Tamara got captured by Zim's daughter and henchmen. When Tamara was about to flee with Conan's friend Artis on a ship, oh yeah, Tamara and Conan had a really good time inside a cave. Anyway, Tamara's cries while being abducted were heard by Conan. Together, Tamara and Conan managed to kill Marik, but Zim was now more furious than ever and pledged to seek his revenge from Conan. Zim used the Mask of Acheron to call forth the spirit of his dead wife, who used to be a great sorceress when alive. The spirit started to possess Tamara, but Conan being Conan managed to kill Zim as well. What could have been a fantastic reboot and revival was turned into a film that lacked depth. Director Marcus Nispel is also known for remakes of films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the 13th, and he thought putting in overabundant gore, violence, and sex would work for a film like Conan the Barbarian. Of course, he was seriously mistaken. While it is true that Conan deserves every bit of violence and gore, his character needs real depth and a tight storyline that's filmed with accurate direction. After all, it is not a slasher film. Although the film tries to look modern and visually rich, it failed on more than a few occasions, and nothing could save it from doom. It was the poor box office collections that ensured the cancellation of a sequel to the film, which was supposed to bring back Arnold in his eponymous role as Conan. What a shame. The only good thing that came out of Conan the Barbarian 
was that Jason Momoa went on to star as Khal Drogo in Game of Thrones, a character that shared many similarities with Conan. Also, Nanso Anozi, who played Artis, got cast as Zaro Zhan Daxos in the second season of Game of Thrones. Conan the Adventurer, 1992. The Conan film of 1984 had already paved Conan's way into the hearts of kids, and whatever was left was fulfilled by the comics that came after the film. A 65-episode cartoon series ran from 1992 to 1993. Although it was named Conan the Adventurer, it was at best influenced by the character. We are saying this because it had almost none of the core themes that were inherent to Conan. The animated Conan wouldn't even steal or kill, let alone get in bed with another woman, and this was all done to make the character suitable for a younger audience. As far as the show's plot is concerned, it revolves around an ancient evil god named Set, who ruled Earth with help from his reptilian humanoids called Serpent Men. Fortunately for the rest of the world, a wizard named Vathalos united a band of white wizards in the fight against the tyranny of Set and banished him and most of his minions into the abyss. However, a few of the Serpent Men managed to escape this purge and took refuge in the dark and secluded corners of Earth, patiently waiting and preparing for the day when they could bring Set back from the abyss. But none of this concerned Conan, who was still a young boy, working for his father as an apprentice. One day he witnesses a meteor shower, which he dubs as Fiery Tears. He collects the celestial objects and brings them to his father, who is a blacksmith. Conan's father creates various weapons and tools from the metal of the meteorites, which he calls the Star Metal. I will make no other sword from this Star Metal. For nothing could match this. The greatest creation remains the sword that he built for his son, Conan. The sword could open gateways to different realms and make the bearer practically unkillable. Conan's father hid the sword under a huge stone slab and told Conan that the sword was his to wield once he was strong enough to remove the stone slab. Conan was living a rather peaceful and happy life with his family, but everything changed for the horse when the Lord of Serpent Men named Roth Amon struck Samiria and came to Conan's village to retrieve the star metal because apparently that was the key to freeing Set from the abyss. Bring it out or I'll tear this pimping village apart! Conan rushed to the resting place of his sword and managed to get hold of it, but it was too late by the time he returned to save his family, as Rathamon had turned each one of his family members into statues. From that instant, Conan pledged to travel the world and thwart Rathamon's plans of freeing his evil god. Five. Conan and the Young Warrior 1994 Conan and the Young Warriors was essentially a soft sequel to the earlier cartoon series. In this one, Conan tries to train three young children named Dragon, Bren, and Nava, who are destined to rule the realm of Hyboria. Furthermore, the kids are gifted and their source of power lies in gems called the Star Stones. The series essentially chronicles the story of Conan and his little warriors as they fight the Serpent Men. Unfortunately, this show was even softer in tone than Conan the Adventure and some have referred to this Conan as Conan the Babysitter. Clearly, this sort of picturization went against all that Conan the Barbarian stood for and all that made him a part of the pop culture. The animated series had to be cancelled, but it brought Conan into a new arena. Conan was introduced to the world of television, which led to his reshaping and evolution. Six. Conan the Adventurer, 1997. Produced by Micheline and Max Keller, the live-action Conan series lived only for a total of 22 episodes and then had to be cancelled. The titular character was played by two times Mr. Universe Ralph Moeller. The story picks up where Arnold Schwarzenegger's Conan the Barbarian left off and brings us back to Samiria, where a sorcerer named Hissa Zul is a ruler who rules his subjects with an iron fist and employs threats and magic to keep his authority intact. Furthermore, he's also responsible responsible for the death of Conan's parents. As should be expected, Conan unites a band of rebel warriors to fight the tyrannical Hissa and free Samiria from his evil clutches. As Conan proceeds in his quest, he faces several monstrous creatures. <laughs> 
but Conan keeps on going undaunted as he's been informed by the god Krom himself that Conan is destined to one day wear the crown. Thankfully, this time around, the series wasn't made for children, and yet, it failed to revive people's interest because this Conan was further unrecognizable in terms of his character. The Barbarian's character was assassinated in cold blood, to say the least. Conan was reduced to a dumb-witted, all-muscle, and no-brain man, which was disheartening and outrageous. Another criminal act that the series did was making the film its source rather than Howard's literature, because it was released at a time when American television was being ruled by shows like Xena, Warrior Princess, and Hercules, The Legendary Journeys. It adopted the cinematography, style, and setting similar to those shows, and hardly resembled the Sumerian or Atlantean setting, despite having an ample amount of sword, sorcery, and scantily clad women, the show couldn't save itself from itself. <laughs> 7. What is happening with the King Conan movie? Just before the credits roll in Conan the Destroyer of 1984, a much older Conan is shown sitting on a king's throne. So that was a clear indication that a sequel was going to happen, but the project fell apart. Later, at the beginning of this millennium, the makers of Matrix, the Wachowskis, had shown interest in making King Conan, a film where Conan would be in his 70s and tired of sitting on the throne. But something evil happens, which changes his mind entirely. But even that project didn't see the light of day, because the Wachowskis lost their interest after they finished making the Matrix sequels. However, all is not lost as Netflix is working with Frederick Malmberg and Mark Wheeler's Pathfinder Media. Given in Netflix's quality and dedication to films and shows, this new project could be every bit as dark, violent, sexy, and heroic as Robert E. Howard wanted his sword and sorcery legend to be. Furthermore, Arnold Schwarzenegger has time and again expressed his interest in reprising his role as an older Conan. But Conan fans are more excited than ever since Arnold brandished the Conan sword in a video about the whole capital fiasco that took place on January 6th, 2021. We wouldn't indulge in the contents of his video or who he condemned or supported, but here's a small piece from the video about that Conan sword. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.